Hello and welcome to a brand new data science project video here on the channel. Today, we're going to be able to predict housing prices through a few different regression techniques. I'm going to take you step by step on analyzing the data, removing outliers, removing different features, building brand new features, and finally predicting prices. Now, it took me a while to get a very high score, and I was able to achieve the top 10 percent so i'm going to show you how i specifically got there and we're going to go from everything from the basics which is like a linear regression which i don't really recommend using for this project all the way up to using a stacking regressor and also a voting regressor which you can get really dialed in use multiple models and get a very great score for this data set the best part is if you don't understand a part of this video I have everything else covered on this channel through my machine learning and scikit learning playlists. So feel free to pause the video at any time, go back and watch one of those videos and move forward again with this project. I assume it's going to be anywhere from two to three hours, but I'm not sure how long this will end up being as a video. So make sure to put it in chunks too. If you find yourself fatigued in the middle of coding, take a break, pause the video, go outside and then get back into it. It's the best way to learn. With that being said, I'm going to jump on my computer right now and go over some of the background. All right, so a few things that we're going to go through really quick right before we start coding. This is the housing pricing uh, advanced regression techniques project on Kaggle. It's also one of their beginner projects as well. So just to show you where I'm currently at, we have the leaderboard over here. There's 4,470 teams. And then I am right over here and I haven't worked on this since 17 days. So my last submission 10, 11, I've been a little bit busy recording YouTube videos and learning PyTorch. But when I did submit this over here, I was ranked 391 and I built this spreadsheet over here just to kind of jot down notes and try to improve my model over time. So what I essentially did is wrote all these different models over here and started, you know, like the, my first time building out this project and then just iterating over it, whether I was removing outliers or whether I was going through and doing a little bit better hyperparameter tuning or adding in more features. I would try to go over here, see what score I had for each of these different models that improve. And you can see like, it took all the way to test number 10 to get 0 0.12402. That was through a stacking regressor, which is something I also learned in this project. And uh, I started at rank 800 and I got all the way down to below 400, which got me to a 9.9% .9 overall, which I'm pretty happy with that. And then like I did have different voting regressors over here. I, I named these VC1, um, but I use a voting classifier in Titanic. So I just typed that out over here. It should be like a VR. And then I talked about a stacking regressor. Um, essentially what I use is at different models. I put specifically what the final estimator was over here. And you can see Ridge uh, performed very well on that side of things too. Again, Ridge performed great twice, but when I threw in the voting regressor at the very end, which I didn't even know was possible, I got my best overall score. And I try to talk about some of these different scores um, or different testing things that I did each time too. So you can see it's over here, like remove outliers, use median, remove Z scores greater than that, feature engineering, voting classifier, it should be voting regressor. Like I said, I made some typos in here. Um, removed a lot of low performing fields, tuning, stacking regressor, adding RFR to stacking. So this is kind of just notes that I always put over here like to work on and different things like that when I want to work on a specific project. Just to show you like, there's a lot more outside of just the code that I wrote for this competition when I was trying to optimize it. And again, I'd spend what, 17 days. So my ranking did drop on this side of things. I probably could get a little bit higher score, but I'm still contempt of what I ended up getting overall and being that I was in top 10% for a little bit. All right, so two things over here, I just wanna mention as well. I already do have this coded out. Now my code over here isn't clean, but I'm gonna be like taking you guys step-by-step -step, line by line and rewriting this code. So uh, that way you guys can kind of see some of the different thought processes on this. I will make some mistakes through here. I'm not a perfect coder. Uh, nor do I expect you to be a perfect coder too. So feel free to go to the Kaggle notebook, which will be linked down below in the description and read it over because I'll also have some notes and markdown associated with this. And if you do enjoy it, like make sure to upvote that notebook as well, or even subscribe to the YouTube channel too. 
And if you do want to use this code on the Kaggle notebook, I'm just asking you guys if you could upvote the notebook before you do copy it. That way I could get uh, my Kaggle ranking a little bit improved. And maybe I can get a bronze or like a silver for this competition. Although I do know it's very tough with like the beginner competitions to hand out awards associated with those specific notebooks. Um, it would be nice to at least have my first one on the Kaggle account. All right, so let me go over this competition over here, a little bit of an overview first for you guys, and then I'll show you how you can build out um, a brand new notebook. So again, just go to Kaggle. I'm gonna link the competition down below so you don't have to search it, but here's your overview. So start here. If you have experience in R or Python or machine learning basics, which if you watched my machine learning playlist that I have here on the channel, I have both uh, classification videos and also a regression video. So I recommend that you watch the classification first, do Titanic, then watch these regression videos before you start this project. You want to start from scratch just to see what, like dip your feet into machine learning, perfectly okay. But I do have a ton of videos on the channel covering the different subjects uh, that I will be coding out within here. So just to know on that side, thanks. And it's a perfect competition for data science students who will complete an online course in machine learning and are looking to expand their skill set before trying a featured competition. Well, that's me because I'm still studying data science, right? Uh, to get started, feel free to take advantage of this starter notebook. You guys will be using my notebook on the side of things. So ask a home buyer to describe their dream house and they probably won't begin with the height of the basement ceiling or the proximity to East West Railroad. Uh, but this playground competition's data set proves that there's much more influences in price negotiation than the number of bedrooms for a white picket fence. And uh, I do agree with that. Just bought my first house earlier this year, but built it. And whew, that, was a, that was a fun experience. Um, with 79 variables describing almost every aspect of residential homes in Ames, Iowa, this competition challenges you to predict the final price of each home. So practice skills, creative feature engineering, advanced regression techniques like random forest or gradient boosting. I don't know if that's advanced, but uh, let's keep going. Acknowledgement. It was compiled by Dean to use a data science education, a credible alternative for data scientists looking for modernized expand versions of the Boston housing which I do think Boston housing data set was depreciated in scikit-learn. Could be wrong on that. Um, all right, let's keep going. Is your goal to predict the sales price for each house? Each ID in the test set, you must predict the value of the sales price variable, okay? And we're gonna be taking a look at the root mean squared error between the logarithm of the predicted value and the logarithm of the observed sales price. Taking logs means that the errors of predicting expensive houses, cheap houses will affect the results equal. All right, so just the Kind of jot that down in the back of your mind. If you're not too familiar with logarithms, just watch a quick mathematics video specifically on them. And uh, it should be squared away on that side of things. And submission and file format. Also, that's another point. Like, it's funny in high school, so many people said, oh, you'll never use advanced math outside these classes. Yeah, wait till you get into data science. Um, All right, let's keep going. Kaggle Learn. Kaggle Learn offers hands-on courses. We don't need that. We don't need that. FAQs, don't need that specifically. Okay, let's go to the data tab over here and go through this really quick. So file descriptions, we have our train and our test set. Uh, that's a little bit different than the videos I've taught you guys. So normally what I'll just upload a data set or just grab a data set and then do a train test split on this. Well, there's two different versions on the side of things. You have your training, which we'll also do our train test split on and our testing, which is gonna be our one that we look for for our final results. Data description, sample submission, so you can see how that looks. All these fields, so there's a lot of these over here. Um, I don't know if you guys want me to go through them or not, but just sales, sales price, MS subclass, the building class, MS zoning, lot frontage, lot area, street, alley, lot shape, land. I'm not gonna go through all these, but again, feel free to read these specifically. I just that way you get used to some of these. Um, other thing is like when I was going through this originally, I was plotting stuff and then I would look specifically what this was over here. So maybe I was a little lazy on that side of things, but yeah, that's what I did originally. And then you have the description over here, uh, basically what's going on with these. So zoning and a lot more information on here. That side of things. And it does look like we are going to have a lot of categorical data. So we're going to have to change that specifically over. And I'll be building out some pipelines and things like that too. 
So that way we can turn this from like a very beginner video, at least like intermediate and stuff like that. I wouldn't say like I'm an advanced data scientist by any means like that, but uh, I'll show you what I learned over time. And then you can see code. So different notebooks over here that people have shared. So like this one has a gold 643 uploads. Maybe one day we'll get a gold medal. So again, if you guys want to check out my notebook and give it an upvote, I do appreciate it. So here's how you guys can get started. All you have to do is go over here and click new notebook. And you can see that we already have our input over here. So this is everything uh, from that competition. If you create a new notebook from scratch, you won't have any data. So make sure you create your new notebook through the competition. Uh, so that way you do have this input and then you do have also this output default on this side of things. You'll get this text over here. This is a Python three environment. You, there you see this scissors over here, cut it because we, we don't need that. Um, and you should be ready to code. So. I'm gonna get prepared to go through this live with you guys step by step and let's get this project done. All right guys, so my brand new Kaggle notebook over here. I just named this Kaggle Housing YouTube video. I, that way I know which one specifically deals with it rather than my other one which I used for testing. And again, at the very end, once I do finish this video, I will be leaving notes throughout this notebook over here and you guys can just copy it if you specifically want to. Now, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to import in a bunch of libraries. And typically you won't know all the libraries that you're going to be importing in until you start writing your code a little bit more. Um, but you could go either way, right? So what I'm going to do first is I'm just going to put in all the different libraries that we're going to use in this video. So that way we don't have any bugs or errors later on uh, when we do use some of the different packages associated with it. So let's start. So import pandas as pd and then we're going to import numpy as np i'm going to say from scipy import stats and then we're going to do from sklearn dot metrics import in mean squared error like that Great, we have that first section. I'm gonna space it out. Uh, so that way we're gonna just press enter over here. And now we're gonna talk about our graphing libraries. So there's two that we're gonna just bring in over here. Matplotlib.pyplot as plt, and then import seaborn as sns. Okay, now we're gonna bring in uh, a few other stuff that we're gonna work on with our data. So like think about this side of things, we're gonna bring in our train test split. Okay, learn dot model, underscore selection, import in train test split. We're gonna bring in some transformers and pipelines. So let's do that. So from sklearn dot compose, import make column transformer. And then also column transformer, transformer, okay. From sklearn the pipeline, import pipeline, make pipeline. Then we're gonna bring in our imputer. So from sklearn dot impute, import simple imputer. Okay, then we're gonna bring in some pre-processing. So from sklearn.preprocessing import ordinal encoder standard scalar and also one hot encoder. And our ordinal and one hot encoding will help us with some of our categorical data, which there's a lot of, right? Okay, now lastly, we're gonna bring in all of our models. Now, what, I, what I've found out, at least from Calico competitions, is sometimes people will delete models if they're performing really bad uh, within their data set. Now, I'm just gonna literally keep everything that I had over here, just to show you guys, like I did build out a lot of models, and also I think it's good practice for you guys too, uh, that way you can get used to different types of regressions. So, let's start off. 
from sklearn.linear model imports in our linear regression, which is our simplest. From sklearn.ensemble import random forest regressor from xgboost import xgb regressor I actually forgot stuff over here um, I need to bring in my grid search CV and everything like that so I did skip a step I do apologize from that and that's going to be over in model selection so let's just throw that in on this side of things let's put in grid search CV as well as our cross eval score cross Val score. Okay, we have that now. Um, XB regressor up next. I need to bring in Ridge, Elastic Net, and Lasso. So from SK Learn. Oh, well, it's actually a linear model. So let's bring that over here for linear regression. So Ridge, Elastic Net, and also Lasso. Then we're going to bring in our Cat Boost from cat boost import cat boost regressor and lastly from sklearn that kernel ridge like that import kernel ridge and i think that should be good for all these i might have missed one or two and we have an error because of that there. And you can run these by just clicking this over here or shift enter, which will build out a new cell down below. But I think we should be good over here, at least the beginning. And this is cleaned up compared to my code, which I originally had. Um, okay. Next, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna set our training and then also our testing. So you can see that we have two CSVs over here, test CSV and also train CSV. So let's use those. So the first thing we're gonna say is train underscore DF. Let's gonna say equal to PD dot read underscore CSV. And then I'm not gonna put this in here yet, but we're gonna put single quotes. Now, I'm lazy. So what I'm just gonna do is go over here and copy all this and taste this over here and say test. Now, what I'm gonna do next is just go over here. You see the train, you see how it says copy file path. Let's go over there, copy and paste. And we do the same thing with test. No need to type all this out. We're doing a lot of typing today. So now we have both of those over here. I'm gonna shift enter this time. And we now have our training and also our testing side of things. So. Let's just do some very basic data exploration on this side of things. And I say very basic because we'll be doing a lot more. So let's start off. Let's take a look at all the different columns associated with it. We had a hint that there's gonna be a lot. So we'll just say columns like this. And yeah, there is a lot. I mean, just looking at this in general, probably don't know what some of these mean. I mean, you would have some ideas for most of these, but yeah, there's, quite a lot on this side of things. We can also take a look at the describe, uh, which will help us with our numerical data, but not specifically our categorical. So let's do that too. So train dot or train underscore df dot describe like that. And here we go. So we don't even get to see all these just because there's so much. And I'm sure there's a saying that we could do um, to make all these show specifically at one time. Uh, but just you kind of have an idea, right? Like on average, we're going to probably have about 1460. There's going to be some missing data across the board. Uh, that's why I brought in our imputer. But you can see everything over here, 1460. You can see like the mean, standard deviation, min 25, 50, 75, or the max. And you can do a lot of like research and diving down that side of things if you really want to. Next thing I'm going to do is take a look at the D types specifically on these side of things. And we're just going to look at... Um, our integers or also our floats. So we're gonna go over here to train underscore df that d types here. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna 
put our brackets in here like this, and we're gonna say train underscore df dot d types. We're gonna say that's not equal to, and we're gonna put inside over here, object. And again, we're just taking a look at the numerical stuff first. And you can see how this is spread out. Like we have our ID, MS subclass, lot frontage, lot area, overall quality, overall condition, things like that. So all this is gonna be over here specifically. Uh, but the cool thing is now we can start taking a look at each of these individually. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a look at specifically scatter plots. And the reason is uh, there are a few things. First, I wanna see how some of these features over here like have a direct impact at our target, which is gonna be the sales price. So I think there is some benefit on that side of things. Uh, but also it's gonna take a look at kind of like outlier detection. So one of the things I wanna take a look at specifically is outliers, right? Because houses are all different and sometimes we'll get some crazy sales, which is gonna impact our overall, like sometimes houses are a little bit crazy and not rational. So we'll see some crazy sales prices based off of different conditions. Let's say for example, like a house has a ton of area, maybe it's in the middle of a farm, right? And all, most of these other houses are in the middle of the city. Well, typically, like if you had more area with your house, you'd see a higher sales price. But because it's in a farm, like far out, maybe the sales price is a little bit lower. And that's just, maybe that's a bad example. But uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff we can take a look at. So let's start off with that. Now, I'm just literally going to go in order. We don't need our ID. Um, it's not needed, right? But we can take a look first at our MS subclass. So here's how I'm gonna bid out this code. So I'm just gonna do PLT, which I wasn't typing, but we'll do PLT.scatter. Now for our X, we're gonna put our specific feature. So we're just gonna literally go down the line over here and maybe it's a little bit tedious and I, I don't disagree with you, but I think this is one of the best methods to at least go through. And I'll also show you how we can take a look at outliers with Z scores. And that's why we imported in stats. Um, but sometimes I think the visual side of things um, does help you out on that. So I'm gonna say Y equals, and then we're gonna put in our sales price, right? Which is over here. And then our data equals train underscore DF. So here we go on this side of things. And I don't even know what MS subclass means. So we're gonna have to go back to that Kaggle housing. So all I'm gonna do is find that real quick. Let's go like competitions. And just go over here to housing. So I'm at the house prices advanced regression techniques. We go to our data. And then we take a look over here. So MS subclass is the buildings class. Okay. All right. So MS subclass over here. And if I type a dwelling involved with the sale, so you'd see like one story, one story here, finish attic one and a half over here, two store 1946 and newer. Okay. All this information on this side of things. This is honestly more of a like categorical value. I don't know why we put this as numeric, but that is just something to know. And that's kind of like why this is all going to be spread out on that side of things. All right. Now we're going to take a look at lot frontage, which is this next one. So I'm just going to copy this code and paste this over here. I'm going to grab lot frontage like this. And we're just going to change that there. Okay. So now we're taking a look at this and this is perfect, right? So we do have some outliers. So you can see like all the way over here with 300, like that's definitely an outlier on that side of things. You can see, like we do see some sort of positive trend associated with these as we go out farther. Um, but these are just way out here and uh, as, as they call it in baseball, way out there in left field. So we need to do something with these. Um, I would recommend dropping these, but we, I can show you specifically what IDs are associated with these. And we can start building out like a tally of different things that we should be dropping. So I'm gonna do a train 
underscore df dot query. And then I'm gonna just say over here with our lot frontage, copy that. I'm gonna say lot frontage. We're looking for anything that is greater, greater than 300. So query is just like a super fast way you could take a look at your data. I use it all the time. And here we go. So we have IDs 935 and 1299. I'm just gonna start building out a tally list and I'm gonna say drop 935 and 1299. All right, so let's move on to the next side of things. So now we're gonna be taking a look specifically at the lot area, which I kind of alluded to, right? We may have some stuff, a large area on that side of things, uh, but not specifically a high sales price. So I'm gonna again, copy this code. We're gonna just gonna paste this over here, grab our lot area, throw it into the X. That's, and here we go. And we uh, definitely have some larger sales over here. You can see like, Lot area size, pretty small. We see like price has increased, but we do have some quite large ones over here. So I think a good value, take a look at it, is maybe like 50,000, maybe 60,000. So let's do that. So again, we can just query again. We'll grab that. We'll grab our lot area. And let's take a look at, let's say like 55,000. I think that's a good number. All right, and then we have a bunch of different IDs over here. So let's take a look at that. So a lot area on this one is 15.9. That's this one over here. We have 21 over here on this one. Uh, both of those should be dropped. This 16 over here. So let's just put those on here. So we'll say 250. 314, we're gonna have 336 and 707. So those are the ones that I would recommend at least dropping initially. Um, other ones, so let's take a look at 452, that's 70. So that's probably this one over here. Let's take a look also, we have our sales price, 375. So actually it would probably be like one of these over here. I think that one's fine. Um, 111 over here, like this one. Well, we already said we're gonna drop that. That's a 707 one. We, then we have 1299, which I think we dropped 1299. Well, not yet, but we have that over here. So we're fine on that. And then we have 1397, which has 57 two. And then also on that side, I think sales price like 160. Um, so it's probably that one, it may have some impact on our stuff. I'll put it down as a maybe. I'm not sure if we're gonna drop that one yet, but I'll say maybe 1397. And let's keep on moving. All right, so now what we're gonna take a look at, so now I just wanna show you guys too, um, how you could do your Z scores with this. And like, again, in my, in my opinion, Z scores are very helpful, but I think using the eye test with your data does help too. So let's take a look at how we do our Z scores. And I actually got a lower score on my model when I did use Z score and I removed what I would consider outliers. And But again, that's something that you could test with if you really wanted to. So I'm just grabbing this from stats. You can do stats.z score. You put your thing over here. So train DF, I'm gonna put in our lot area, okay? Put over here, lot area. Then we're gonna do dot sort values, sort values like this. And we can set up a tail. So um, we only have what, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like, yeah, I could have just looked at seven rows, but I'll just do like a tail of 10 over here. And you can see the Z score. So like 313 has a Z score of 20. Um, that's Oh, actually it's ID 314. Um, these are gonna be a little bit different. You can see 249, 250, 313, 314. Um, 20, that's like, that's an insane Z-score number. Uh, 335, 
or in our case, 336, 15, then we have 14, 10 for 707. Uh, the one I wasn't too sure about is a 4.6, which again is a very high Z score in comparison to these others too. Like they're around that range, but I did see that happen a lot within this data set. Um, definitely these high Z scores need to be dropped in general. And again, you can use eye tests, but I just wanted to show you guys the quote unquote technical way that you could take a look at this specifically. And yeah, so that's not good. Um, now we're going to take a look at our next one over here, which is going to be an overall quality. And we'll just throw this over here like that. And then we'll type that out. So overall quality. And as expected, right, we do get to see how this is working. Now, it's kind of weird that we do have two quality tens, but they're very low. Like you can see these sale prices. I mean, so let's take a look at this. So again, just we do our query here like that. And we're gonna say overall quality this time. And this time we're gonna say it's gonna be equal to 10. So put equals 10. And we can take a look closer at these sale prices. So specifically, we're taking a look at 524 sold in 2007, which I mean, I was very young then. I think it was 2008 though that had the housing crash. So it's kind of weird why we have a very low sales price on there. And then the other one we're going to be taking a look at is 1299. I was in 2008, that was 160,000, which I think 1299 is a troublemaker for us. I'm pretty sure we've talked about that before. Where is it at? Yeah, I've already said to drop 1299, so I'm not too concerned with it. Um, the other one was 524. I swear I'd sell 54. I don't know. I thought I saw it earlier, but. Um, okay. We're going to say maybe five, two, four, five, two, four. It's, it's just, it's so far down. It, I, it's definitely going to impact our model in some capacity. We could also take a look at this four and why that four sold really high or even like this eight that sold very high too, but I'm just going to stay with this for now. And again, feel free to like make changes to your model that are different than mine. That's the beauty of it. And see if you score better. I mean, I hope you do score better because I've, I'm building on a baseline for you guys and uh, you can just continue to work on it. Or as I'm pretty much done with this project. All right, so now I wanna take a look at, I think we're on overall condition now, which I mean, I guess I'm gonna just, eh, I'm just gonna go through my stuff over, over here. Overall condition. All right, so we're on that side. Now we're gonna take a look at this scatter so we have quality and condition i'm not too sure what the differences between these two are to be honest with you and maybe that's something that we take a look at later with correlations um essentially you should be dropping things that are very highly correlated but uh this too is a very high sale that six is a very high sale yeah that that too is weird so Let's take a look at it. And we'll just put two over here. Sales price, 39.4, and that is number 379. That is way off on our model. So let's put that over here as 379. No bueno. Okay, now I wanna take a look at five. So just to show you that we can do a few different things within our query that makes it really nice. So we can first say oh, our overall condition is gonna be five and you just throw your and sign in here. We'll say our sales price, or it should be sale price, is greater than, I think this was over 700,000. No, over 700,000, 700, right? Should get one ID over here, 1183. So just copy that. Put that in here, 1183 is way weird. And we're gonna do the same thing with the six, right? We see this way up over here in comparison. I mean, we have nines over here that are way lower and that's a huge gap from the lowest on the side of things. Um, we'll take a look at that too. So 
that there. And it's the same because I did not change that to a six and 692. All right, let's keep going. Now we're going to take a look at your built. And uh, all right, let's take a look at that. So we'll add a few lines over here. Copy that. Go up here, which maybe I need to just copy this code or just make a list of these uh, just to save some time. Do you think I'll do this after that one? So after your build, we'll do that just to not scroll up as much. And we do have like one very high sale over here. I know these are technically very high too. Um, let's take a look at this first one. So this is gonna be a simple. Well, I guess actually we could just put this over here, two things. So first thing we're gonna take a look at is our year built. Year built is gonna be less than 1900. Less than 1900. And then we're gonna say our sales price is greater than 400,000. And I do have an issue on that one. Yay, we love issues. All right, let's see what I messed up on this one. Your build, not built. And we have ID 186, not side of things. And maybe I can take a look at these two over here as well. But I think we've already grabbed those. So let's take a look at the next thing. As I promised though, I'm just gonna copy this list. And I, again, I do know it's pretty tedious, right? Um, but if you really wanna explore a data set, this is what you're gonna have to do sometimes. So we'll just throw all these over here and we're gonna just copy this code and keep moving forward. So now we're gonna look at year model over here. And again, all default features on here, we will be taking a look at building around features too. So we have that side of things. Um, just see this one that's kind of standing out minus those two really high sales prices. So maybe we'll take a look at that. Um, We'll grab another one of these over here. And then on this side of things, we'll say your build there is less than 1970. And sales price is over 300,000. So 314, we might want to drop that there as 314. All right, let's take a look at our next one on here, um, which is going to be Mass VNR area. All right. No idea what that means, but let's take a look at that. Ooh, we have some, uh, looks like we're gonna have some fun outliers on this side of things. Let's look at this up. Mass VNR. Masonry veneer area in square feet. Masonry. Okay. Um, let's take a look at how those are working. So we'll grab our query, throw this in over here. Grab this on here. We're gonna see it's gonna be greater than 1500. Um, we do see that there's positive correlation on this. So maybe we'll leave these alone for now. This one is obviously weird, but it's one of our outliers already. That's going to be greater one fifty, and it should be actually fifteen hundred, not a, a large number, and that's two ninety eight. So throw two ninety eight in here, and let's keep going. Now we're going to take a look at basement square feet one. That's I I expect this is already one of our outliers. We are way out over there. Man. 
and uh, say it's greater than 5,000. Twelve ninety nine. What a shocker! I think that's the third or fourth time we've already seen twelve ninety nine. Um, okay, let's look at number two now. I don't know what the differences are between one and two. Maybe we can take a look. Type two finished square feet. Very descriptive. Type two finished square feet. All right. Well, I don't know what that means. It's okay. Say number two over here. Let's see. Another one way over here. And uh, you know what that means. Take a look at it. So let's go over here. First thing I'm going to take a look at is this sale over here, too. It's pretty high. We're going to say it's greater than 400. We're going to say and. We're going to take a look at the sales price. So sale price is greater than 500,000. I may leave this one alone because we see like a subtle growth on here and it's not too far off. Obviously zero does have an impact there, but this one is really high. It should be number two, not uh, number one. It's 441. 441. Okay, now we're going to be taking a look at uh, basement unfinished square feet. All right, again, these two over here, but nothing too crazy. That's fine. Like a total basement square feet. All right, we have another one over here. I I guarantee you it's gonna be twelve ninety nine again. Guarantee. And how I know is I also did this earlier, but we'll put this over here. Anyways, we'll assume. Shocker. Shocker, I tell you. It's $12.99. It's there again. All right. Then we're going to take a look specifically at first floor square feet and then second floor. So, grab that. And I'm going to save you guys time. That's going to be $12.99 again. Way over here, running our data. What, second floor square feet? Okay, that looks a little bit better. Maybe a few things I could technically remove. But we'll start going through this a little bit faster on those. Uh, we're getting close over here. We don't need sale price because we're already going to have that. Um, okay, now we're going to take a look at low quality here. That's we have this one over here that's pretty high sale with low quality. I guess we'll just query that one. Over 500. I guess I probably should put sales price also, but 186. Over here, six. A. Okay. Now we're going to take a look at GR over here. Good area. And I do apologize for this being super tedious, but um, I did get very high. I got higher scores when I removed all the outliers. So we're going to just go through that. There's two over here. So let's take a look at those. Write our query. There you 
just to take a look at. This is going to be over 4,000. Or like, we'll say like 4,400 or something like that. 524 and 1299. We've gotten those multiple times. All right. Great. Let's take a look at full bath and half bath. Oh, uh, we have the one over here with three. Maybe we can drop that one. Like it's just literally one single point over here. This is kind of funny. Seven thirty nine. Maybe we've covered seven thirty nine already. Hard to remember. Over here, look at the next one, which is basement half bath. And uh, we have these over here. And just to show you again with Z scores over here, because like we do have two points, let's just say stats that Z score. You can do train underscore DF. Throw this in over here, our basement half bath. I just want to change this up a little bit. <laughs> and then we're going to do dot unique. Should only have three Z scores up because of zero, one, or two. And you can see, like, we have an eight Z score, which is pretty high on that side of things. And normally you would want to drop those. So let's just take a look at our query on here. Grab that for basement half bath equals two. And that's 598 and 955. Five. Great. Now we're going to take a look at full bath and also half bath. And these were just the basement side of things. I thought those were the full ones at first, so I do apologize. With those, I'm going to grab those over here for full bath. And like I said, I am trying to go through this as fast as possible. This is kind of the the boring part of the project, um, but we have full bath over here. Nothing too out of the ordinary. Grab through half bath. Again, nothing too crazy on there, so I can move those. All right, and a few other ones over here. We're gonna take a look at. Bedrooms above ground. Grab that. Wow, we have eight over there. That's a pretty high number. Let's grab our eight. That is six thirty six. All right, I think we're almost at the final stretch. Kitchen, get that single one with three, or actually it looks like two possibly. I think we're at two. Which will give us a pretty high Z score on this one. So 49 and 810. 810. All right. We'll add in a few other lines I could. Total rooms above ground. That seems very similar to some of the other stuff over here. Seems very similar. Maybe 14. And um, like I said, 
you disagree with some outliers, just no reasons. All right, fireplaces. There's a lot over here at three. I know they have a big Z score, but we have one, two, three, four, five. Maybe it could drop them. Figure it's gonna be some of our already suspects that we've already taken a look at. Garage are built. All right. Looks like we just have this growing over there. Nothing too much of a concern. All right, garage cars. You have a few over here at four. One, two, three, four, five again. Right. Garage area. Maybe we'll look at this one over here, which is under 1200. Yeah. Which will populate a few of them, but that's all right. All right. It's going to be less than, or sorry, it should be greater than 1200. And 62 on that side of things two and um, what's the next one that's all for 16 eight well, what do you know 1299 again maybe 1191 also it's a little low already dropping those two so we just have the other data points um i guess we can drop it you can always add it back later right okay now we're gonna look at wood deck All right, now we're gonna take a look at open porch. Wow, that's a, a very low one on that one. Very, very low. That's greater than 500. We'll throw an open porch over there. 34, 900, 496. So 496 on this side of things. All right. All right, looking closed porch. Of the one way over here, which is definitely a really high Z score. I mean, it looks like it follows the trend, but that is a, I mean, we're talking at least like over 100 on there uh, between the difference. I mean, that's probably what, like 380, and that's probably like, I guess I could find. Well, it's probably hidden over here, but either way, that's a um, large number. That's number 198. We'll drop that one. 198. Final stretch, final stretch. I have no idea what three SSN porches. Um, I'm curious, too. Three season porch area and square footage. 
I've never seen a three season porch or even heard of that too that looks like oh it's what those look like huh okay I guess just like all glass and stuff like that that definitely has an impact on sales price you know this reminds me of like <laughs> as funny as it is when I was a kid I went to Wendy's there was one in my childhood home that had a literally a whole area like this so I guess that was a three season porch all right um although the Wendy's wasn't the nicest but that's that's kind of funny though I had to bring that up and again we could probably take a look at this outlier I mean there's not a lot of these that have a three SSN porch so we could always change that too um the having one or not definitely seems like it would uh make some sort of impact but not sure for um okay but before I get distracted let's grab our screen porch over here I know we still have a lot to cover, man. A lot to cover. Um, all right, so that's our screen porch over here. Take a look at the pool area. Though. Pool area. And um, we have this over here. I don't know what uh, Miss Val that's MO sold. So I assume that's like month sold. Like that month sold, yeah. And that's year sold. What's a miss Val? Value of miscellaneous features. Alright, I'm just gonna ignore these over here. Um, let's grab our values now. And we'll just throw all these specifically in here. So I'm gonna actually save you guys some time and I already did this beforehand. So these are the values that I ended up grabbing because there are gonna be some duplicates and stuff like that. And I don't wanna copy all my code and things like that, but these were the outliers. So we had like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 24-ish um, out of 1,600. So really quick, just like pause this, just type this out, or I guess just copy from my Kaggle notebook because it would take like another five to 10 minutes for me just to go through and um, essentially just copy this. So now what we're going to do is drop these and it's pretty easy to drop them. You can just go over to train DF equals the train DF. We'll see train df dot id is in we'll put our values which it was lowercase v and we're going to say equals false so everything else minus these values will be in there and now we now have our new train df on that side of things and up next, we're going to be investigating null values. I'm just going to take a real quick break in this video. All right, so now that we took a look at all these over here with the scatter plots, we dropped some values. Now let's take a look at some of our null values. We can do this by creating a data frame. So I'd say pd.data frame. Then you put inside over here, train df is null. We sum that. And we sort the values. We say ascending is false. So that way, whatever has the most null value shows at the top. And then we do a head. And I know from earlier, because I did run this, uh, there's about 19 or 20 that do have null values. So I'm just going to do head of 20. And we have all of this over here. Great. Now let's start taking a look at some of these different features. So pool quality, like we're missing a ton of data associated with it. So I'm thinking like we can drop this pool quality 
Next, we have like miscellaneous features. I know we took a look at the documentation on here and it says like, well, at first I looked at miss value, not features, but miss features talks about elevator, second garage, other shed, tennis court, none. Like elevator would definitely increase the price. Garage, second garage would too, I'd assume. Tennis court, I mean, that sounds super rich, right? Um, but a lot of this is missing and maybe we could like even break this down farther, but just to show you like what's in our data frame on this side of things, All right? We can just go over here, train DF. And this is assuming that we didn't have documentation, right? Um, not everything that you're ever going to work with data wise won't always have documentation. So just to show you over here and I would just do dot unique. And um, that, right, so bundle values, shed, garage to other, and then tennis court is T-E-N-C. So there's definitely stuff that we could technically take a look at, which actually, I don't even think there's an elevator one on this one. So just really tennis court's the only thing. And I think that would just impact so much, it's like so little in essence, like there's probably like only a few of these out there and I know we could dive deeper, but I don't think it might be the best to keep this feature. Uh, the next one I take a look at is Alley, which I think is next, right? A-L-L-E-Y. And again, what we can do with these is we can either impute or drop these in general uh, because we don't have any null values. Um, so we have NAN, gravel, and then also pavement on here. We do have those specific options. Um, I would probably just fill this out as like there's no alley or there's a gravel or pavement side of things. At least that's what makes sense for me and we can set this up pretty basic. We can always still drop alley, but I wanna take a look at this. Um, we're gonna do a, essentially a box plot on this side of things. All right, so here we go. This is how I'd recommend you do this first. So train DF, we'll say we have our alley in here, which I guess I could have just copied this, right? Then we're gonna say dot fill NA. I'm gonna say no on this. And then we'll say in place equals true. In place equals true. And again, we can drop this in a bit. I'm also gonna do this for test, just so that the same. And yes, I could have technically wrote a function that we make these changes to both of these, but I didn't, right? And maybe I'll do that on another video. But here we do have our train and test. They've been filled specifically. And let's take a look at this. So I'm just gonna do sns.cat plot. We're gonna say data equals train or df. Then we're gonna say x equals alley, which is there. Then y is gonna be the sales price, y equals sale price, and we're gonna say kind equals box. And here we go. So no, we have that over here. This is a 50% mark. Gravel is lower than pavement, which looks about the same as our no. Okay, up next, We could technically see how much are in each of these if we really wanted to. Um, and this isn't the most efficient way to do it, but I could literally just do like this. Watch this. So we could just say train DF and we'll say like alley equals gravel. If we really wanted to and count. Again, probably not the best way to do it. Um, Oh, I, I forgot query. And I do have an issue again. And it's super basic. I just forgot to put the actual quotes around this. And you can just see like we have 49 over here. And if you really wanted to see pavement too, right, like about 40. So there's there's not much specifically in here on this side of things. 
All right, so up next we have, what is it, fence? Let's take a look at the fence side of things. And we can just do this unique value again for fence. If we wanted to, or take a look at the docs. So one, two, three, like four types of fences. I'm just gonna in place these right now. And I'm just gonna say the same thing, no, for it. So throw both of those in here. And then we're gonna just gonna put this over here. I wanna see it like if a fence does have an impact. This one didn't really look like it had much of an impact. Um, we'll see this fence. So no fence actually performed better than the ones with fence. You can see actually we had a little bit of a decrease if they were MNPRV or any other ones, which no idea what that means. So we're just gonna say fence over here. Good privacy. So let's see if good privacy is more. Good privacy is literally about the same with the 50% mark. I know no goes up higher and stuff like that. And then NA is no fence, which is all of these over here. So don't really see it making too big of an impact on that side of things. Um, next, what we have on here is Mesa VNR type. I think we did do some research on that originally. Um, and just going to put this over here. Mesa VNR type. So have a few of these, we'll just go through, we'll impute them again. All right, fill all these NAs, it's no, and then just take a look how this worked. All right, no is actually a lot lower over here. So maybe this is something that we could use is um, we do have, I, I'm assuming like this is brick. Or is he stone? Well, there's two on here. We can do a research on here. Veneer type, brick common, brick face. I, I don't know. Difference is a cinder block, which I don't even see that in there. Okay. None or stone. So maybe something we can use, it's fine. Next we have our, um, let's see. We actually have eight for the area side of things. So we could just throw this as zeros right now, just to save some time a little bit later. I am gonna do that now. I think it's area with a capital A that and instead of no because this is actually numerical we're going to throw in our zero on here so zero and also our zero so now that's done okay and we already took a look at this scatter plot a little bit earlier and that was in our session when we we're taking a look at specifically if we had outliers we wanted to remove in a little bit of data analysis, just taking a look at some of these scatter plots. So, okay, yep, yeah, next is gonna be our fireplace. Also, what I'm gonna do, I think, is just copy all these. So I don't have to continue to go up. We'll just put everything like right here. I think this should be good. So, just do another unique over here. Do fireplace quality. So NATA good, fair, X, which is okay, PO. Done all those. We're gonna do the same thing. Um, this time, let's just take a look at these specifically. We're gonna fill our NAs as no. No. That's, and um, we'll plot it out in a second. So fill that out, so we'll add another code over here. Oh man, I actually just messed this up. We're gonna change that up. So 
there should be nothing that got filled because I already filled all the NA on there. Hope that doesn't make an impact. I don't think it should. Man, we're going to change that out again. Sorry, guys. We're going to put fire piece quality here. All right, so you can see that we have no down below over here, but then we do have some larger ones, TA, good, fair, X, which is the highest on this side of things, and then PL, which I would assume is poor, but like a poor fireplace is about the same as no, but everything else does go up, so probably something that we will want to keep. Um, okay, so there's that side of things. And um, we do also have fireplaces on here. I don't know if that was one of these. Yeah, we do have fireplaces on here. I know it's gonna be a little bit different. I wanna just take a look at that. I would assume like fireplaces, there's fireplaces. That's a little bit outside the scope. You can see zero, one, two about the same, three's a little bit higher, which kind of makes sense with those. Um, we're on lot frontage now. So let's take a look at that. I think that was another thing that we looked at a little bit earlier. So just to confirm my suspicion. This is our scatter plot for lot frontage. We removed all those outliers. Not a lot, but we those outliers a little bit earlier. Let's just scroll down over here and uh, work on it. So first thing we should talk about is this is gonna be like the same as the zeros over here because it is numerical this time. And we're not missing a ton. It's only 255 on this side of things. I just put this as zero over here, and I think we're good to go. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at garage year built. Um, I'm not too sure we need this one. And the other reason why is when you're building a house, your garage year should be about the same as the house itself. Now there is, are gonna be ex exceptions, especially with these older houses that are present in our data set. Um, but if we go back over here, I'm pretty sure we took a look at year built across the board, if I remember correctly. Um, maybe we didn't. That's the year remodeled. Oh, okay, here, year built. So I'm not sure when garages became standardized with houses. Maybe I can look that up real quick. But I would assume like, since we do have a lot of data points, like 1950s onward, that this might not be needed. So I am just gonna do a quick correlation on this one. So what we can do is train underscore DF, put over here as garage or built, like that. And you can do dot core, and then inside over here, we can do train DF, we'll put over here as a year built like that. And um, we have a pretty strong correlation, 0 0.82. So up to you if you wanna drop it, I think I will be ending up dropping it. Uh, there are some features that we could take a look at, like if the garage year was different than when the house was built. But I do think we have like, Another one, I'm, I'm thinking we have another feature in here, uh, that like maybe garage remodeled or house remodeled or something like that, that could be similar. So I'm okay with dropping that one. Um, we're gonna take a look now at what garage condition, I think it is. So, Let's take a look at that. We have garage condition, garage type, and garage finish, and garage quality. So we have like four garage things in a row uh, for some of that data that's missing. Not a big deal across the board with that, um, but that is something that we're gonna have to address. So 
let's take a look at that next. So the first thing is garage condition. So we're just gonna grab our code up here, which is unique. Put that in there. So T A F A N A, good, poor. So this would be kind of another one where it's a no specifically if we are missing that. So we can just put that in over here really quick. Here. Okay, no. And then just put this over here. Okay. So TA, not sure what TA means. X, there's like nothing over here. PO, no is down below, which means they have no garage, which has already kind of shown some of the other data that we've taken a look at. So garage condition, we have that. We're gonna take a look at garage type now. Maybe that will make a bigger difference. Let me just put garage type over here. Same thing, so garage type is here. The garage type like that in here. All right, so carport, basement, two types, detached, built-in, and attached. The so built-in, see way higher over here. Take a look at garage finish now. We're just gonna copy this over here. I think you guys kind of understand what I'm trying to do, at least on this side of things. And like you could go way more in depth if you really wanted to. But this is a good start. I think this video is going to be well over three hours anyways. So no under here. I mean, again, with our garage finish and maybe some of these are going to be correlated. I'll just check those a little bit later. And lastly, we're going to take a look at garage quality. So have those in here. There is that side of things. But I should probably take a look at some of these. Make sure. So just double check over here. Attached, detached, built in, carport, no, no basement two types, unfinished garage. There, garage quality. I'm just gonna double check that one real quick. So this one, I you could technically change this one. Um, we have no here, but it says in our doc. Yeah, no garage if it's in a, so put that in over here and I think we should be good to go. All right, so a few more left to go through. I mean, we're very close to finishing it. So let's add in a few more lines of code. First thing we're gonna take a look at is basement bin type two. Um, in documentation, or you can just grab this, probably faster or better to look at the documentation to see what all these values are. But, um, all right, so unfinished, which that actually might be our answer on this one, this is the unfinished side of things. Let's see. Oh, yeah, so unfinished is probably the one that we wanna go for on this one. Just copy that. 
and we'll just say what UNF UNF both of these and we'll just throw this over here. So there's that side of things. I mean, it looks about the same for most of these. GLQ seems pretty high, but I have no idea what GLQ means. Take a look at the exposure now. Probably the same thing. Oh, we do have a no on this one for basement exposure. Assume that no is going to be like nothing on there. Refers to the walkout or garden level walls. So maybe So we have no exposure or no basement. I'm just gonna keep this as no. Maybe it's not the best approach to it. You can always change these up if you want to. So let's just put those here. You know, for each of these, these technically there'd be no exposure, right? If you have no basement anyways. Um, okay, here are those. Now we're taking a look at basement quality. So we're missing 37, basement condition 37, basement bin type 137. So, all right, let's take a look at these first. Basement quality. X and A, so for our quality side of things, good changes up. I mean, let me just check this out real quick. That's the height of the basement. So no basement, poor, fair, typical, good. Yeah, so we'll put this as no on here. It's weird, I thought it would have been like quality, not the height of the basement, but okay. I guess the condition is probably that one that takes a look at it. Condition, typical, it's probably the same thing. I know I didn't make a draft for that one, but we'll have to go back through it. So we'll have to make a decision on what we're going to drop and stuff like that. Didn't really make that decision yet. So let's just build these out real quick. Copy this twice. See if there's a uh, difference. Yeah, there's a pricing difference. Look at that. Um, X is way high. Good TA, no FA. That's pretty good. And uh, this basement condition. I mean, it seems like they're very similar between the two. Let's see what this one talks about. General condition. Yeah, I mean, they're different, but. Three left. Yep. 
can type. There's a lot of finishes. If any of these are here, unfinished. So could technically just throw this under unfinished, which I might. Eh, I'll do that. I don't know if that'd be fully correct though. But um, and I am deviating a little bit from my original code, so I may come back and change in this stuff a little bit later. But I'll have probably the most accurate result in my final calculus notebook. So if anything is different on there, I just change this up slightly. Probably do just a little bit more testing. Uh, we're going to just grab this over here, throw that in. And man, I messed up my uh, copy and paste thing again because I got to put fin type one here, fin type one, and that. So this over here. Uh, GLQ, it seems like there's a little bit of a premium on there, but everything else is kind of standardized. Okay. And uh, we're down to what, like two more electrical and then mass VNR area. And square feet. Maybe we'll just put this as zero. For the eight values. And again, this is something we took a look at a little bit here. So zero there. All right. And then lastly, we're going to take a look at electrical. Um, I'm just going to put, we have mixed, we have fuse F, fuse P, fuse A. I'm just going to put standard on here for anything that's missing. Maybe it should be in a different area. It's literally one result. I don't know why it's missing. But we're gonna just gonna throw those over here. Cut those out. I ran this one, I think. I'll run it again. All right, so now let's talk about what we're going to drop. So I'm just going to say train EF equals train underscore DF dot drop set over here. We're going to say columns equal. And now we got to go through and figure out what we're going to drop. Now just going from the top. Maybe I'll just copy these two. So I think 100% we drop pool, miscellaneous features, alley, and fence, at least in the beginning, right? So let's drop those. Okay, just add more code below. So could technically do more features with them, but I'm just going to drop. You just have too many null values, to be honest with you. Alley, and then also fence. So that's gonna be first things that we are gonna drop in. All right. Keep going through. All right, fence. The VNR type, I did see a little bit differences on these. So I think I am going to keep that in here. And we did fill that area associated with it. We do have a lot of garage stuff and the fireplace quality is a little bit different than fireplaces. And we fixed both of those. Lot frontage, I already fixed that. Garage you're built, we talked about dropping that. Probably is correlated. Some others are probably correlated too, but I just didn't do those. But we'll drop garage year built. Also gonna drop garage condition. So your built condition are both there. 
garage type and finish were a little different, I believe. So let me just double check over here. So finish and then garage type, they're both different. So I'm gonna keep those in there. I'm keeping garage quality. Uh, now we're gonna look at basement bin type two. So let's see that. These looked honestly like they're about the same across the board. I'm gonna drop that. I don't think people care about that as much. And then ID, I mean, we're gonna drop ID a little bit later. Electrical, we're keeping that. Vin air area. Uh, basement fin type one, we are gonna keep that because you have that GLQ that's a little bit higher. Condition and quality. So condition, we have that and quality. So those are a little bit different. I'm gonna keep both of those on here. And then I think the only third thing is exposure, right? Did I not put exposure as a, I don't think I did. I'll just take a look at that real quick. Yeah, we'll keep exposure. Is it good, min average, quality, condition, which just double check. His quality was the height and condition with general conditions. So they're different. Yeah, just want to make sure. So I'm good with dropping those. And uh, we'll do the same thing for test. But test in here. So you test DF. Test DF. There we go. And we have that. Awesome. So up next, I'm thinking we do some feature engineering. So feature engineering. And there's a lot of features that we could technically build out. I'm not gonna do a ton. I think we'll still be like four or five of these. But my recommendation is you build out more features and then you test to see if you got an improvement in score or not. You can always delete features. And I think originally I had like eight or 10 features, but some of them didn't really move the mark. So I did end up dropping those and removing them from my code. So first one I'm gonna put over here is gonna be, let's see, we'll do a uh, house age on this. So you have house age, and this is gonna be equal to our year sold minus year built. So train score DF, we'll throw year sold. Sold minus train underscore DF. And here we'll have year built. And I'm just gonna copy and paste some stuff for our testing in a bit. Next, we're gonna do train df and we're going to say house remodel age so house remodel age and that's going to be equal to your sold minus and instead of your built we're going to say we're going to be year remod add be good there. Now we're gonna take a look at total square feet. So train DF total square feet. Let's see that's gonna be equal to, and there's four things we're gonna add up. So train DF, which I might literally just copy this because we're gonna do this four times. So we'll just do two, three, and four. So the first thing that we're gonna add in here is our first floor. 
first floor SF. Then our next one we're gonna have is I think second floor like that. So I'll just put that over here, second. Next we're gonna have basement finished square feet. So B S M T, there we go, finish SF1. And then we're gonna do the same thing, but for number two. So we have that in there now. Okay, now we need to take a look at total area, which is a little bit different. So there's a total area in here. And that's gonna be train, DF, GR, live, area, plus, we're gonna say, train df total basement square feet like that now we're going to do total baths so train df love total baths so that's going to be equal to and we have one two we're now four on that side of things. So I'm just gonna copy that. One, two, three, four. I guess I should have copied the brackets, but whatever. Uh, first one we're gonna do is basement, full bath. Then for our next one in here, we're gonna put full bath in general, full bath. And then we're gonna times 0 0.5. And we're gonna put all our half baths in here. Go view. So the first one was basement half bath. B S M T half bath. And then for other half bath, we're just gonna have this half bath. And then lastly, we're gonna do um, total porch square feet. So train DF, total porch square feet. This hit's gonna be equal to, and there's actually a lot of these over here that I need to add up. I think there's like, let me see. My example code one, two, three, four, five. So let's add those. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So first what we're gonna add in here is open porch. So open porch in capital SF. Okay. Up and next, we're gonna have three SSN porch. Three SSN porch, no square feet at the end. Okay, now we're gonna have enclosed porch, no square feet at the end. Enclosed like that, then screen. And then lastly, we're gonna have wood deck SF. Wood deck SF. All right, now I didn't run any of these. We're gonna have to do the same thing for a test. That's why, like when I mentioned, I should have probably just built a function originally, but whatever. And then I'm gonna say test DF like this. Okay. And then I'll just run all these at the end. It's that one. Hopefully I made no typos, but that's always a pipe dream. I know I'm gonna make typos and small mistakes. It's a fun part of debugging, right? Throw that out over there. Let me go through.
All right, now let's run these. No issues on the first one or second, third. Oh man, all right, basement. We have an error. Total basement square feet. And it shouldn't all be capitalized, that's why. No I in there either. All right, we're good there. Yeah, we got the multiply sign. Throw those in there. Oh, one more error. Enclosed porch should be a capital P. It should be. Great. That's working. All right. Um, lastly, what we're going to do, I'm going to drop a bunch of columns again. So just copy all this over here. And just keep it like this. I'll just copy it down below what we end up doing. This. So first thing I'm going to drop is our ID. That there. Then we're going to grab this year sold. Then I'm going to grab your built. Then I'm going to look next and I'm going to grab your remodel add. Okay. Then I'm essentially going to just copy these four over here. First floor, second floor, basement one and basement two. Oops. Then these live areas, side things, Little basement square feet. Then I um, hope this isn't cutting out for you guys in this video, but we have to grab all these baths, basement full bath, then our full bath, and I'll I can go through this again too, or feel free to copy basement half bath. Half bath, final stretch. Then we're going to grab open porch and three SSN porch, enclosed porch, screen, and finally wood deck. which just simplifies our features and uh, get some good ones. I'm just gonna copy this. I'll just change this over here to test for each of us. Test and test. Hopefully no issues with this code. I'm gonna run this. And those columns should now have been dropped. And I just wanna show you really quick the correlation matrix on here. So, this is pretty easy. We can say correlation matrix equals train EF dot core. Now you want to make sure it's numeric only. So numeric only equals true. And two more lines of code. So we'll do DLT dot figure. Consider fig size. So fig size equals 20 and 12. On that side of things, and then we'll throw in a heat map. So SNS heat map. First thing we're going to throw in here is this correlation matrix, which we have already defined. Then I want to set annotations equals true. You can set up a color map, see map, 
people's over here. Cool. Warm. And then FMT equals 0.2F. Do have an issue with that? Or did I say? Oh, I know what I messed up with. I forgot to put a little more perms around those. Heat map, not heat map. And here we go across the board. So essentially, if we have something that's a very high correlation, it would be like around negative or positive 0 0.8 or higher. So garage area and garage cars, there's a high correlation on that. So we may want to drop one of those. I mean, we're almost at like 0 0.9 on there. So I'll make a note like drop garage area or garage cars. And then um, this total area and sales price, there's a uh, high correlation, which is good, right? Because we're not going to use our sales price. We're going to drop that for a model. Overall quality and sales price, another thing that's very highly correlated. I'll just do a quick brief look over here. Sales price, overall quality. So overall, I think we're pretty good over here. Um, I'm just going to drop one of these two. I have to figure out which one I'm going to drop, either garage area or garage cars. So it's what? Garage area like that. Or the garage cars, which I assume garage cars was one of those categorical ones that we took a look at possibly. See garage area. I'm just do control F. So there's the garage area. And then the other one was garage cars. Uh, here we go. I do see that. So garage area or garage cars zero through four. Uh, or garage area to drop one of those, which has a higher correlation with sales price. I'm curious. Um, where's our sale price at over here? And now let's look for a garage. So there's that. They're about the same too, garage area and garage cars. Um, where's six five and six six? Is um are these correlated with other stuff? Six one for garage cars. Five six five zero. Oh. I'll just drop garage area. So one more to drop. On this side of things. All right, so train, train, test, test. And we drop that. And um, I think we're gonna do a few more minor things before we start running some models. So up next, we're gonna take a look at a histogram of some of the different sales prices. So sns.hist plot like that, and that's from Seaborn. Uh, we're going to have to put in over here a few different things. So up first, we're going to put train df. Then we're going to say x equals over here train 
EF sale price. And then we should be essentially pretty good over here. And you can take a look at how this looks. Now, this is very skewed. You can see that there's stuff over here, 600,000. Um, but like, fire on the middle is between 100 and 200,000, which say good luck finding a house like that today because at least where I'm from in Florida, you can, you're looking at least right over here for anything. So uh, one of the things that we can actually do to this data set is kind of change the sale price. And I did see this in a Kaggle notebook. I actually found this uh, from watching Ken G's version of the Kaggle housing. So essentially what we can do is apply a logarithm to the sales price and we are going to get better results. So a uh, shout out to that video when I ended up watching it because I did learn some cool stuff in there. So uh, we're going to put train DF and then we're going to put over here sale price. Then you're going to say equal NP dot log one P and inside over here, we're going to say, I don't even know why I needed to say that because I could just copy and paste this directly over here. And uh, we do have an issue because I put sales price instead of sale price. I don't know why it's sale price. I, I guess I'm rambling, but I keep putting sales price in here multiple times. And I did that also when I was working on this project. All right. So now if we literally want to see this again, check this out. And now this is a lot more normal, right? Over here, some outliers probably on this side of things, which probably would clean it up if I dropped them. But either way, we are looking way better. And I think we are almost ready to go. So now we're going to be taking a look at building out a pipeline. Yay. Because those are, uh, it's going to be a little bit fun. So what I would recommend first what we're going to do, if I can code correctly, is we're going to look at more D types. So I'm going to go over here, train DF D types, and then we're going to say this is going to be equal to, and throw object in here, object like that. And this is everything that we're going to have to change before we throw it into our models because you can't run categorical data. That's a lot. And we're going to have to look at ordinal encoding or one hot encoding essentially for each of these. And we'll have to make that specific decision. Now let's take a look at stuff where it's not an object. So put that over here. And here are all of our other columns. All right. So let's define two different things. So the first thing, what we're going to do is ordinal encoding. So I'm just going to call this ODE underscore calls equal, and then we're going to build up a second one, which is going to be OHE calls equal. And we're going to put a lot of stuff because we have a lot of information. And one other thing I'm going to do really quick is I'm just going to be copying and pasting all this over here. Because essentially, well, I guess I don't need to delete these objects. We're gonna have to make a determination of where we want to put this. The other thing that we're going to want to do is have something for numerical calls. So we'll just say num calls. And this is the easy one, right? Because we can just say equals train underscore df dot select underscore d types rids here we can say include equals and put int 64 as well as float 64 and i think that should be everything on that side of things and we'll say dot columns and then Underneath it, we're gonna just gonna say num calls equals num calls dot drop, and we need to drop our sale price. So sale price. 
you know, just make double check. We only have N10 float 64s. Good, good. So that's correct. And now we need to talk about ordinal versus one hot encoding. We're going to just essentially go down the board with some of these over here. And let me explain. So for like one hot encoding, the order doesn't specifically matter, but ordinal encoding does. So let me explain a good example of this. We took a look at electrical and so, or even better, yeah, we'll just look at electrical or landscape slope. All right, so like this is a perfect example over here for land slope. There is an impact in the order on this specific side of things, right? So we have gentle, moderate versus severe. Uh, gentle being the lowest, moderate, medium, severe is the highest. So that would be kind of like a perfect example where we can use ordinal encoding. One hot encoding might be, you know, a word would be a, a good example of this. Oh, you know what a, a good example would be? And I don't know if it's specifically in this data set, it probably is, uh, but the exact street something is specifically in, right? Um, so like, let's say you have two different streets. That'd be a good example for one hot encoding because there's no typical inherent like value of one street being worth more than the other. Now I do understand like some streets could be very, very pricey, but in just in general, right? Uh, another example, and I did this in another data set, was taking a look at cars from different countries. Um, for that example, you had one hot encode the different countries, right? Um, so what one hot encoding does, it'll, it'll build out new columns for each of these, uh, but for specifically ordinal encoding, what it's gonna do is just have one column and you'll start from zero and increase like zero, one, two, three, just depending on what it is. So that's what we're gonna specifically do with all of these. Now, I did do this already in my data set beforehand. I'm just gonna copy and paste these over here because there is so many on this side of things and I, I will just double check really quick for all of these and then we can talk about it a little bit of why I put ordinal or one hot encoding. So I'm just gonna copy this code over and I did make, like I said, I made a few other small minor changes between uh, what I originally had and what I'm doing now. So could possibly have a little bit worse score, could have a little bit better score. We'll explain. So like, here's the street example, right? What I mentioned, two different streets or three different streets. There's a lot more than three different streets within this data set, um, but here we go, right? So let's make sure we removed street on here. So that's gonna be gone on that side of things, okay? Uh, next, we're going to be taking a look at is the lot configuration. Make sure that's still over here too. Look for an L lot config that's here. Great. So we have lot config. We're looking for neighborhood. Another example of that. Where is our neighborhood at? Right here. Awesome. We have condition one and condition two which are right here, condition one and condition two. We have our building it type. So let's look for a building type right here. Building type, good. All right, house style and roof style. So let's look for those two over here. House style and roof style, both on that side of things, right? Exterior first, exterior second. Let's look for those exteriors. Right here. Both of those are gone. Mass VNR type. Mass VNR type. Foundation electrical. Electrical is right here. Foundation is right here. Okay, seal type, MS zoning. Seal type is here. MS zoning is right here. Okay, seal condition, have that over here. Great, now we have heating, which is just normal heating. Garage type and roof material. Garage type, 
and also roof material. All right, so we have everything that I mentioned earlier for one hot encoding. Now let's take a look at ordinal encoding. First thing is lot shape, which we have lot shape, land utilities, land slope, which I mentioned. So those are all there. Um, basement quality is there. Like that. Quality. Basement finish type one. Central air. Functional. Fireplace quality. Good. Garage finish. Garage quality. To make sure you saw it. Yeah, garage finish and garage quality. Good paved driveways there. Exterior condition. Overall quality. I uh did I skip overall quality? Maybe. We're gonna we'll just double check that one in a second. Kitchen quality is there, good. Basement exposure is there. Heating is there. I don't know if I skip basement condition also. Um, let me just double check these two real quick. I skip that. Huh. Oh, overall quality wasn't an integer. I don't know why I had that in my uh, original one. Like I said, you, you do make mistakes on uh, auto coding. So I'm just gonna double check my original one real quick and see why that showed up in the ODE columns. Yeah, it's definitely an an integer. How did that show up over here? Huh. That should not have been in there. All right. And let me just double check this basement condition because I don't see that. I forgot to drop it or what we did on. Yeah, basement condition should have been there. And um, this goes up. So that should have been in a um, ODE. Might have dropped it, my first one. Either way, we're just in here. I don't think it'll make that much of an impact. And if it does, like I said, not a big deal. All right, so now let's just run these really quick. Good, have no issues. Awesome. All right, well, I think we are looking good on that side of things and we can continue to work on our pipelines. All right, so here we go. Let's take a look at a few of these over here. So I'm gonna essentially build out three pipelines on this side of things. So we'll say like num, Pipeline equals and then pipeline steps equal like that. And I'm going to do this for ODE, which is going to be our ordinal. So I'll just say like ODE and then one hot encode. And uh, let's start with this. So bring that out over 
here. All right, step number one, we're gonna impute, we're gonna say our simple, simple computer, we're gonna say strategy is our mean, equals mean, like that. And then we're gonna apply a standard scalar to this. Scalar, standard, scalar, put nothing inside on that side of things. I think we should be good for this one. Okay, our ODE pipeline, let's open that out on here. Uh, first thing that we're also gonna do is impute. And this time what we're gonna do instead of a mean, since this is Categorical information, we're just going to say most frequent. So go over here where that says mean, we're going to say most frequent like that. Okay. And then we have to make one more line on this ordinal encoder because we have to actually call an ordinal encoder. So we're going to say ODE. And we're going to say that's going to be like that. Oh, I should go here. And we'll say ordinal encoder handle unknown equals use encoded value, which we should have no unknowns because we're imputing it. But I just like bringing this in over here. And we'll say unknown value equals negative one. All right, now we're gonna be taking a look at our one hot encoder. I'm gonna copy over the same line over here for most frequent on this side of the things. And then what we're gonna do is set up our one hot encoder. And honestly, we could kind of use a lot of the same code to be honest with you. So we can just put OHE, put one hot encoder, one hot encoder, we're gonna say, Handle unknown, we can use encoded value negative one, and then we can say, well, it's gonna be a little bit different on this one. So I wanna say for handle unknown, we're just gonna say ignore, which I guess I could have done for ODE, but whatever. The other thing I'm gonna put over here is we have to do a sparse output. Sparse output equals false. I think that's what we have to do. Now we're gonna have to put these together and the way that you're gonna put these two together is through a lovely column transformer. So let's do that. Call trans equals column transformer transformers equal. And let's go through uh some process of this. So we can literally just go in order if we want to. So our first thing that we have is this num pipeline. So I'm just gonna say like this is num num p or something like that. Doesn't doesn't really matter. Um we're gonna throw in our num pipeline and then we're gonna put in our num calls like this, comma then we did what? ODE and then OHE, so. We'll do ODE, OHE, ODE, OHE, and then I think it's ODE. Oh, actually, sorry, guys. Grab ODE pipeline, and this should just be OHE pipeline. And I think that's what I specifically need, but there's still another step associated with this. So let's move this over here and uh, I'm gonna enter that over, tab that. So when you're doing a column transformer, you do need to mention what happens to the remainder. So I'm gonna say remainder, but there shouldn't be a remainder. But we're going to just say it's pass through. 
And then we're gonna also say n underscore jobs equals negative one, so this runs a little bit faster. This formatting sucks though. Um, should be it. All right, I'm happy with that one. Did I call these? I did not, so let me just run through these really quick. Shouldn't have any issues. And I, uh, My spelling is going to always kill me. OHE is done. Palm Transformer is done. All right. Little, little bit more. So I'm going to say our pipeline equals pipeline. I'm going to say steps equals. And then on this side of things, you can say pre-processing, and then we'll put over here our column transformer. Okay. All right. Now, I think I did drop my sale price already. I just want to double check. I did not. So let's drop our sales price now. Or sale price, not sales price. Done that a lot. So we can now build out our X and Y. Actually cut that out for a second. All right, so we built out our pipeline now. So here's the fun part. We can uh, set up our X and Y. Now, so x equals train.df, train underscore df, dot drop, sale, price, and we're gonna say axis equals one. And then our y, lowercase, is train df, sale, price, like that. And of course, I do have an error. Should be axis one, not negative one. It's tiring making these videos, guys. Um, we've already recorded well over two and a half hours, I think. So I do apologize when I make these dumb bugs, but it's a lot easier said than done uh, when you're talking and coding at the same time. All right, so now we can take a look at our pre-processed side of things and what we're gonna have to do is x pre-processed equals pipeline dot fit transform. Throw in our capital X over here. I'm also gonna make this x pre-process capital X2. And hoping that works, and it does. And now we have this array, okay. Now we can set up our train test split. So we can say x train x test y train y test equals train test split. Throw in our x preprocessed. Throw in here our y. We'll say test size equals 0 0.2, random date 25. All right, now it is time to build our first model. So I'll say build models here, and we're gonna start off with the very basic linear regression. So LR equals linear regression, that's, now we can fit our data, so we can say lr.fit x train and y train. We're great, we have that over here. We can set our prediction, so y pred equals lr the predict x test. And I, uh, I'm actually gonna change this to y prediction. One of my 
issues I do all the time in coding is just call everything Y prediction. So I'd like to have it like this. And uh, let's look at our mean squared error. So mean squared error. And then you put over here your Y test. Then we'll put in our like Y prediction. So far we off. And there is our answer. We are way far off, but that's kind of expected uh, with linear regression. It's probably not the best model to use. And I can tell you it definitely is not, except when you can use it with stacking, it's pretty good with that side of things. So now for essentially everything else, we're gonna be building out parameter grids. I'm not gonna do that with the voting regressor at the end, um, we're stacking. But besides that, I will be building out all the specific models and we will be doing uh, the parameter grids. All right, I'm back from my next break. I hope the lighting wasn't too bad. I realized I forgot to put on my studio light over here. I'm quite a bit tired today, so do apologize. So we're gonna do a, a random forest regressor now. I'm out of it. It's, it's gonna be better now because I grabbed another Celsius. I hate drinking two in a day, but like it does give me energy. Forest regressor and uh, we'll put a random state of 13 in there. Not sponsored by Celsius by any means either. Um, but I do drink them every morning. So uh, we'll set our random forest regressor in here and then we'll set our param grid. And I'm gonna put a few different parameters in here. So I'm gonna do max depth, ETH. And these are some of them that I had the best results for initially within my data set. And uh, maybe they're not the most accurate now because I did make a few minor changes throughout, but we'll see, right? Then estimators. And also I should mention this video is not specifically out yet as I'm recording. It should be before I do this video, but I learned something new with something called Optuna. I'm not going to implement it within this project. Highly suggest you watch it because it's a better version of hyperparameter tuning and I love it. Like besides like basic tutorials, I probably will not be going back. Uh, to what I do right over here with this parameter. So highly, highly suggest that you watch that video because it's, it's revolutionary, man. It's so good, I enjoyed it. Um, okay, so we're gonna do a grid search on here. We're gonna say like, we can just put RFR on here or we can say estimator equals RFR, it doesn't really matter. Um, one thing I need to do because I have such a bad habit of it I'm just gonna rename our param grid also, param grid RFR. So I always just call it param grid and it's not good. Uh, we're gonna do a CV equals five, scoring equals negative mean squared error. And we'll say N underscore jobs equals negative one, like that. Uh, once we fit this data, it's gonna take maybe 30 seconds or so. So we'll say fit, X train, Y train. And uh, let's see. Oh, that's not good. <sighs> Max, not mad. Let's rerun this. Need to drink more Celsius. All right, and uh, while that's going, could just set this up. And uh, we'll get ready to go. I'll let this run and we'll be right back. All right, so now that we have this in here, here's how you can get your score on this side of things. Um, this is probably the best method to do it, but NP square root like this, square root, you can do a negative one times your RFR CV uh, best 
score like that. And we're looking at a 0 0.133, which is pretty good overall, um, but we will be getting better scores in general. And if you do want to see the best parameters associated with this, you can just do RFR underscore CV dot best params. And you can see max step 15, min samples split three and N estimator is being 500. All right, and we are off. So next what we're gonna do is look at an XGB regressor. I'm gonna open up a few more lines. So you can just do XGB equals XGB regressor. Set another random state. I think I put what, 13 on this one? So we'll do the same thing. MC equals 13, which is awesome. Uh, param grid is going to be a little bit larger than this one from prior. Uh, the reason why is I did a lot more tweaking on this. I actually had some pretty good results in general when I was submitting this early on. So I kept trying to expand the parameter grid and get a better score. So first thing that we're going to do is a learning rate, learning rate, which using this a lot so far in PyTorch. I have just started doing some PyTorch training last week. And uh, learning rate is in quite a lot of information on that side of things. Okay, we're going to say n estimators is 300. There. We're going to say our max depth. That side of things is 3. And I know there's only technically one parameter with that, but um, I was getting the best results. And if I put a lot of more parameters in here, it is going to take a while to run this. So min child weights. Let me put like one, two, three. Gamma. And also the reason why I put a lot of different parameters in here, and this is another great case for Optuna, is sometimes small changes can have a big impact. So I use my XGB in a few different things later on in the code. So we want to make sure we get the most accurate can up here. And uh, I think originally too, for some of these values, I literally just asked chat GPT. Now this for sure is going to take a while. So once I run this, and also my bad habit, let's make sure this is XGB like this. Um, all right, let me just throw this in over here. I'm going to change the CV to three this time. And. I'm dumb because I just put my RFR CV here instead of XGB. I'm just gonna, just in case, recall that there. All right, um, it shouldn't really have a big of impact. Let's fit our stuff now. Let me just copy this. And I'll just prep this over here. To show you guys what is going on. I don't think we're gonna do the best parameters for everything, so I'll just stop it after that random force regressor. It'll take a little longer. And I'm gonna run these two lines and I will also be back after that. So 0 0.116, which is way better than how uh, our random forest regressor worked. But now we're going to be working on a ridge. Now, this isn't going to be the most accurate, but I do use it a little bit later on in the code. So we're going to throw this in over here. Also, I am going to call in my original code. I also took a look at lasso and elastic net. Um, I'm not going to actually do these in the specific video. And the reason why is it doesn't go towards uh, my final end result. And I feel like it'd be kind of a waste of time and also in this notebook. So I do have videos on those if you want to check them out. Otherwise, just giving you a small heads up. 
So what we're going to do is going to set up another parameter grid over here. Let's see, ridge equals. And first thing we're going to do is put our alpha values in here, which you've used our ridge regression, you know our alpha value is pretty critical to get our best specific results. So I'm going to give a pretty wide range of it. So one, three, five, ten. Um, uh, and then I'm going to set up also a solver, which I haven't had the best results with a solver, but uh, the default usually works the best for me. And we'll still try out a few. So SVD. And I know I need to put single quotes around this one over here. All right, now we have that. The param grid has been built out for the ridge. Now let's take a look at our ridge CV. So ridge equals, and uh, we're going to copy our grid search. Ridge on here. All right, we can go back to five. It's not too bad. The side of things. So we have five. Just fit. I guess we could just copy that. And we'll copy this over here too. Just to show you, although again, you're not going to see the best results. So we're in these two codes and I will be back. It probably shouldn't take too long. All right, so our ridge fit, and then we have a score over here of 0 0.109, which is pretty good, um, but it doesn't perform the best with the testing data set. I'm just gonna give you that as a heads up. Now we're gonna work on a few other regression techniques. I do wanna give a quick heads up. I actually imported in a few others, which I forgot originally up over here. So we have gradient boosting regressor, voting regressor, and stacking regressor. They all go under ensemble. I already have random forest regressor here. So I'm just gonna, copy these over on this side of things. Um, so make sure you just copy these right, gradient boosting, voting regressor, and stacking regressor. I'm gonna put that over here. And then I'm gonna import in light, L, light GBM as LGB. Also, as a heads up, I'm, not, I'm no longer gonna be using kernel ridge. So I'm gonna get rid of that specifically. And I'm also not going to be using elastic net or lasso. So I will be removing both of those. Um, but just again, heads up what I'm adding in over here. I just don't want to call it down below. I want to have this as organized for my final version. So just rerun this as well when you make those additions on the side of things and also subtractions. Uh, so your notebook is now updated. All right. So we should be good on that side of things. But now let's take a look at our gradient boosting regressor. I'm just going to add a few new lines. So GBR equals gradient boosting regressor like this. A. And then now we're going to have to set up our pram grid. So what I am going to do is go up over here to our random forest regressor because there's some similarities between the two. And I'm going to rename this first as GBR. Okay. So the first thing on here, we do have max depth. For this one, I originally put 12, 15, and 20. So we'll put 12, 15, and also 20. Then we take a look at N estimators. On here, I put 200, 300, and 1,000. So we'll put that here too. 200, 300, so 1,000. Uh, min samples split, I did not put on here, but I did have min samples leaf. Put min samples leaf, and I put 10, 25, and 50. So we'll put those over here, 10, 25, and 50. Okay. So up next, we need to also put our learning rate, which I also have a learning rate right here. We'll just copy that over. And for learning rate on this one, I actually had some very small values. So I had 0 0.01, then I had 0 
zero one and I think zero point one, but I'll just confirm. Yep, that's what I had. And I'm missing one. I have n estimators, yep, max depth, yep, min samples, leaf, yep, learning rate. Oh, max features. So and that is the one I am missing. Let's put that in over here. So max underscore features. And let's just put that over here. So 0 0.01, 0 0.1, and 0 0.7. And I know these numbers seem like they're off, but I did a lot of hyperparameter tuning uh, earlier on and tweak these to get the best results with our testing data set. So we have our parameter grid now. Let's build out our grid search. So we're just gonna put that in here, put GBR, GBR CV, and then essentially what we're gonna do, go back over here, GB run our GBR on that side of things and uh, I'm gonna run well before I do that I need to put in our fit so but just copy that right over where is our fit so I'm gonna run these and pause the video and we will be back once this is done. So there we go is our first one now fitting and we're gonna find out our best score. So this last one took honestly forever to load. I would recommend that you do a CV at three, not a five like I did. So don't wait there for like 10 minutes or so. Um, all right, now we're gonna do our LGBM regressor. So LGBM regressor equals LGB, but LG BM regressor like that. And uh, we're gonna have a pretty big param grid on here too. So param grid equals, and let's build that out. So first is boosting type. Then we're gonna say two different versions. So we're gonna do a GBDT and then dart then we're going to do number of leaves so num or leaves like that then we're going to do 20 30 40 20 30 40 and lastly well we have two more we have learning rate which is going to be 0.01 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and lastly, n estimators, n estimators, outside of things, and we're gonna say that is 100, 200, and 300. 300 like that, and I'm just gonna say param grid LGBM, should be good there. We're gonna do our CV. Make sure you put three instead of five like I did. So make sure that's a three. We'll say LGBM CV. Go in our LGBM regressor. That's okay. Now we're gonna fit our data that over here fit this and lastly we're gonna do our prediction or not our prediction on this one but see our specific score so put that over here do that and I'm gonna let this run for a few minutes and here we go and this doesn't seem that accurate 0 0.127 but I can promise you we do use this a little bit later. All right, so now what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna build out a voting regressor. So I'm just gonna name this voting regressor as VR. We're gonna say that's gonna be equal to voting regressor like this. This does get a little complicated. So just 
bear with me for a second. And I tested a lot of different variants of the voting regressor because you can get some pretty good results, uh, but it does take some time to practice with it. So first thing what we're going to do is we're going to throw in three of our different regressions in here. And essentially what this is going to do is since we're going to put three in here, in a perfect world, we will get a little bit better results than them individually. And in this case, it, this does happen. We get a little bit of better results within our testing data set because of this. So let's see, let's build this out. So the first thing we're gonna do is set our GBR in here, put a comma, then we can do a GBR underscore CV, and we can say best score estimator like this underscore, and we're gonna have our first on this. Actually, I put an extra parenthesis on here, but we don't need that there. Okay, so we have our GBR. I'll, I'm gonna put two others on this side of things. So we're looking to be looking at our XGB and also our Ridge. So we put this over here. And I suggest that you guys both, and I suggest that you guys try multiple different types of regressions. Maybe you have better results doing other things, but I found this trio combo worked the best with the testing data set. So that's what I'm gonna use. And it also performed very well with the training. Uh, so I'm about our GBR, XGB, and Ridge. And this goes back to over here, right? Like I made five of these and three and two. So like five, three, and two often perform the best, but three worked the best uh, when I also included it with stacking, which we'll get our best side of things. All right, next thing that I recommend you do, and I actually need to, close this out first, so we close this out, is you set weights. Now, weights, you put more, more of a weight on the regression that you wanna have. Now, what we're, we're gonna do is take a look at weighting all these regressions over here. And you put a higher weight on something that you wanna see more importance for. So what performs better on both your training and testing data set, with obviously a little bit more of a preference on the testing, so what I'm gonna do is weights two, three, and one. I tested multiple combinations uh, and this worked the best for me. But again, feel free to tweak with this and see what works the best for you. But I found in general that XGB performed the best followed by GBR and then Ridge, at least in this instance. So and that's what I'm gonna do. And I do have an issue on this side of things. So let me take a look what is going on. So it says invalid syntax. Perhaps you forgot a comma. So I think, nope, I still have this. VR equals voting regressor. Let me just take a look. Hmm, GBR.CV. Something. I'm probably blind. And I am because I need to have a comma after this. And I think that's what's gonna work. And yeah, one other issue I have is I need to make sure GBR and XGB are capital. Did I make XGB lowercase? No, put GBR. All right, there we go. That's why you want to standardize uh, like how you define these models. And I uh, definitely did not when I was recording this video. All right, so now we have to fit our data. So I'm just gonna do vr.fit, so x train over here and also y train like that. And that's here. And just a quick way that you can test how this worked. I'm just gonna do a Y prediction and we'll say like VR. It's gonna be equal to, and then we'll put VR.predict, throw our X test in here. Okay, then we'll do our mean squared error. Throw in our Y test and then our Y prediction like this. 
And then we'll also put squared equals false. And we see 0 0.1194, which isn't too bad on this side of things. And we now have to continue moving forward. So one thing I probably should put before our voting regressor is our cat boost regressor. We don't use it specifically in this voting regressor for the final results. Um, but personally, like I'm going to build out a document like this. I'm going to put it a little bit ahead of it. So I do apologize. So we're going to put this over here like that. And let's start building this out. So I'm just going to call this as over here, cat boost right here equals cat boost regressor. Then inside over here, I am going to put a few different parameters. Um, first, I'm just going to call out our loss function function because we're going to use the root mean squared error. And then we're going to put a verbose equals false because I don't want to have all this populate when we run this cat boost. I do apologize. I skipped right over this. Now we're going to set up our parameter grid. I'm going to say param grid cat. Got an itch over here. We're going to see that's going to be equal to, and let's build out our parameter grid. So first we're going to do iterations. So inside over here, we'll say like 100, 500, 1000. Then we're going to set up our depth, DPTH. And I set that up to four, six, eight, and also 10. And then we're going to set up our learning rate. Learning rate. And then our learning rate, we have a bunch of different values. So we're going to start with 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and also 0 0.5. It's our param grid. Now let's do our grid search. And like I said, sorry about going out of order. I did not see that on my side screen and I completely forgot to put that over here. Um, okay, so we're gonna say cat CV. And we're gonna just throw our cat boost in here. I'm gonna throw this over here like that. I'm just gonna do a CV of three, mean squared error. And run that. And we'll just put cat CV dot fit x train y train. And then I'm also just gonna this real quick and I'm gonna run these and I will be back once this is done all right so the cat ended up fitting and we got 0 0.114 which is pretty good overall and that's why I am going to be using it with our stacking regressor here at the very end so let's build that and this is going to be our final regressor for this video I'm gonna build out a few new lines and Roy, you're going to go from there. So I already imported this in. So we're going to say estimators equal. And here's the fun part. We got to write out every single one of our estimators that we specifically did. So first thing that we're going to do over here is our GBR, right? And we're going to comma. We're going to say GBR underscore CV dot best estimator like that. Okay, put a comma over here. And I think we're building out five in general. So we are gonna just copy that. Two, three, four, and also five. And let's start building others. So we have XGB. And I might have to run this a few times because I can't remember what was capitalized or not. I think GBR was one of those that we capitalized. It was, so we'll put that over here like this. Um, after XGB, we have CAT which I just put over here is cat CV. Good. Lowercase like that. Okay. Then we have LGB over here, LGB. And that was LGBM. I think that was all lowercase LGBM. 
And finally, we're going to throw our random forest regressor in here from the beginning. So we put that in here. And that I know for sure was capitalized. So I didn't put my linear regression over here. Uh, I did test. Well, I think it was a, either voting or stacking with linear regression. And I they didn't have pretty good results. But when I used the voting regressor as a final estimator, I did a little bit better. Um, all right. So RFR CV is not defined. Maybe if it, it is just lowercase. Grid search CV has no, huh. You know, it's probably because I over wrote that a little bit earlier. That's a hundred percent what happened. I'm just going to rerun this real quick, quick in the back end while I'm coding down below. Um, okay, so now it's because I overwrote that a little bit earlier. Uh, we're going to do a few other things really quick. So we're going to just set our stacking reg regression. So I'll just put like stack reg equals and we'll put stacking regressor like this. Okay. And first thing that we're going to set up is our estimators. So we're going to tab over a few times. We'll see estimators equal and we're going to equal to this estimators that we called a little bit earlier right and then we're going to say final estimator which i'll tab this out in a second estimator equals and then we're going to grab our voting regressor which is our vr over here so just copy that or i guess literally i could have just typed out vr and i'll wait for a second for that to um rerun above for this I still have a few other things I have to do. So first thing we're going to do is fit. So we're going to put on our X train and also our Y train. And then if you want to see how well this performs as well, right, we can technically just do another one of these tests. And uh, we'll say stack like that. We'll put stack in here too. All right, so here's all that. And then I'm just gonna get our output ready. So essentially what we're gonna do is something pretty basic. So what I'm gonna do is y stacking equals np dot x. And then what we're gonna do is stack red which reminds me, I need to change that VR into stackred.predict, um, but we're gonna do stackred.predict. And then other thing, man, I keep forgetting stuff. We also, on this side of things, we need to first, we also need to bring our testing through our pre-processing. So we're going to say DF test pre-process equals pipeline dot transform put test DF like that. Okay. We have our Y stacking down below dot predict. And we're going to have to put on this side of things, our DF test pre-processing. So we put that over there. The other lines of code. So we're going to say DF Y <coughs> stacking out equals test DF throw in our ID like that. Okay. DF Y stacking out. We can do this again. We'll put our sale price, sale price. It's going to be equal to our Y stacking over here. And then essentially what we're going to do is save this to a CSV. So I'm going to say DF Y stacking out. Dot to CSV. 
and then we'll put over here house predictions stacking. I always put the date, so like 1028.csv, and then set your index to equal false. I'm just gonna check up and see if our random forest regressor is done. Which I hope it is. It's still fitting. So I'll come back again in a few minutes once this is done and I'll run those other cells uh, so we can finalize this. All right, so we ran our random forest regressor. We're just gonna go back over here. And that worked now. Again, it was just because I accidentally overwrote it a little bit earlier. We have our stacking regressor, that worked as well. Now we're gonna have to fit this. And while that is fitting, I'm gonna click on this, click on this, click on this, and click on this. So I don't expect to take this too long to finish, but it might take a few minutes and I will see you again. So guys, don't kill me on this one. We did get this working, right? For our stacking regressor, we had 0 0.118. Um, but we have an issue down here. We get this error. And the reason why we get this error, as I was looking through my code, and here's why. Let me go a little bit over here. All right. If you look in our testing data set, we dropped the ID column. So I... Uh, need to actually go back over here and ideally you'd want to rerun your terminal just because it might change some stuff on here but the rest of the code should work now i have to go to a concert or i'm going to be a little bit late so what i'm going to do is i'm going to rerun this and we'll be back a little bit tomorrow just to go through the final results and also submitting the csv all right so i'm back I'm just reran everything this morning, and now you can see that we have 184, right? And then if we go to output, it says slash Kaggle slash working. We have our cat boost here, but we also have our housing stacking prediction. So there's like really two methods on how you could submit this. I am just gonna submit this over here. It says submit to competition house, pricing advanced regression, right? You can submit your version of the notebook. You have 10 submissions. Your submission file must be named submission CSV. So I actually have to rename this really quick. So let me just rename this over here. I manually submitted this when I was doing the competition originally, but this will submit your notebook, which is kind of nice. So I'm going to just rerun that over here. Okay. And now if I refresh this over here, you can see that we have a submission.csv. So now we can go over here, version one, Notebook Kaggle YouTube version one. Click over here, submit. And then I'll see you have the queued over here running just now. So this will save your notebook, uh, but also this will run over here and we will get a score shortly. All right, so this is still loading. We're 11 minutes in. It's literally gonna rerun all this over here. So I would assume it's gonna take like an hour or so, um, but it will end up getting submitted. But I just wanna show you guys really quick the other way to do it. And then now we, we can see our score. So all you have to do is you go back to your competition page, which is house prices, advanced regression techniques, and you go over here to submit predictions. Now you have 10 that you can work on every day and it resets. So I recommend that you maximize it where you have that opportunity to do so. Now here's all my videos that I have recorded for this project, but you just go over here to downloads and then you drop this house pricing predictions, whatever the name is, you don't need to have it specifically a submission CFSV. If you're going to submit your notebook, you should, but whatever you want, right? So house price prediction stacking 1028. This keeps me updated at least with my Excel spreadsheet that I have built out uh, for this project. And I just click submit. Now this will run this code and you can see over here, I got 0 0.12819, which is not my best one overall, um, which over here was 0 0.1241. Again, there's a little bit of differences between these two notebooks and I will be able to make those changes over time, but it's not a horrible score by any means. Hey, you made it this far. Well, congratulations. You probably learned a few new things with regressions or also Kaggle projects. If you did make it this far and you did find this video helpful, I'm asking if you could please subscribe to the channel. It's 100% for free, but it does allow YouTube to share this channel with other people that are trying to learn data science. So 
subscribe down below. I also upload about two to three videos every single week, as well as one portfolio project or course every single month, I'm putting a ton of effort into this channel. And I want to make it one of the best on YouTube. So here's the other thing. Uh, I have a few videos that you should check out. Now, if you haven't done the Titanic project with classifications, I recommend you watch that video. Um, it'll be over here. Now, if you want to learn even more advanced stuff, I talked about it a little bit in this video about Optuna and how it's even better for hyperparameter tuning. I have that right over there. So check those out now and I'll see you in one of those videos.